With a high voice. I think it says high time video. Oh, it's a high voice. It's not a high voice. It's on the top. Yeah. Usually, I usually see a button that says like high time video. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Let's let it go. Can you do this? Okay. Somebody for the shade zone. Это напоминает среднего слона на твоей фотографии. Так, Паша, не трожь святой. Uh, okay, guys. Um, before we begin, and we begin a couple of minutes, uh, after the last talk today, we will make an attempt to do a group for uh, it will be outside, so maybe without mask for a brief moment. Uh, although a group watching mask sounds interesting, I will entertain this idea. Thank you. I, I, I think the interesting would be to make a random permutation of masks. <laughs> <laughs> you see, with probability one over E, uh, <laughs> nobody is going to have. Uh, <laughs> 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 so uh, I imagine this is going to come up in a place called Cross Campus near Sterling Memorial Library, and uh, we will make some attempts to walk there in an organized fashion. Like, like, like this? <laughs> <laughs> right, the talk is cancelled, and now we're kind of very much and I will stand up coming. <laughs> I hope everybody is there. Uh, all right. All right, so let's start the afternoon session. Uh, we're very happy to have Pavel Edinoff, who will tell us about analytic Langlands correspondence over C and R. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm very happy to speak at this conference in honor of Sasha. So, so I met Sasha first, uh, the Gelfand seminar, uh, 
35 years ago or something. He probably didn't uh, notice that I met him because I was just a student and uh, I was trying to sit in the back so that Gelfand would not call me and uh, ask me to explain what the speaker said. Uh, but then um, I interacted with Sasha more when we were already in the United States. And this has been increasing over time to talk to him more and more, I think. And uh, it's uh, well, he always is an inspiration for me. It, uh, he, uh, uh, carries uh, the uh, true spirit of uh, uh, Moscow mathematical school, Gelfand school, uh, where there was no areas of mathematics, there was just mathematics, and you could should travel freely between borders. There were no, no borders. Okay, so, and um, so I will try to give a talk in the same spirit. So this work of uh, joint work of myself with uh, David Kashdan and uh, Edward Frankel, it's at the crossroads of uh, analysis, uh, algebraic geometry, uh, uh, and the integral systems, special functions, number theory, and so on. So, uh, so let me first recall very briefly what actual uh, Langland's story is about. And actually, uh, as Sasha correctly noticed that uh, today, uh, today is uh, at least until my talk, uh, inclusively is not just an MIT day, but also a kitchen day or Langland's day. And so, uh, so actually what was said by Jivet and uh, maybe even more by uh, Roma is going to be very helpful for me. Uh, so, uh, so what is the usual Langland story about? Uh, so this is really, uh, uh, so, so let's uh, consider over the function field. So f, uh, f of x, where x is some uh, smooth projective curve. Uh, uh, this is the, uh, essentially harmonic analysis on the modular space of bundles. Over FQ. Uh, so, uh, uh, so this means that in the Hilbert space of L2 functions on bunch FQ, uh, where these are, uh, this is the set of all uh, isomorphism classes of G bundles on X over FQ. And uh, we put some measure. So there is a, it's a countable set. And we put a measure is one over the order of the automorphism group, which is a finite group. Complex yeah, complex valued functions. So L2 functions are actually complex valued functions, which are L2 with respect to this measure. So essentially sequences. Anyway, and uh, so uh, and so what does it mean we want to do harmonic analysis? which means that we are interested in uh, eigenfunctions of KK operators which is a, which are certain commuting uh, bounded operators acting on uh, this space and uh, in general not just eigenfunctions maybe uh, 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 so functions correspond to discrete spectrum, but you can also consider continuous spectrum, which means that you will not necessarily have eigenfunction lying. It's, it's not going to be normalizable. Uh, so, uh, and uh, they correspond, so, Eigen, uh, eigen functions, uh, the discrete spectrum corresponds to uh, representations of the Galois group 
into the Langland's dual group G check. And so G is a connected reductive group here. So this is a kind of very rough picture. And uh, uh, so let me explain what is analytic Langland's about. Uh, are developing with the uh, uh, Frankel and Kashdan uh, is uh, is the same story for L two of uh, one G over a local. So instead of finite field, we have a local field. And uh, uh, so, so there could be non Archimedean, such as the object, for example, or FQ of T, or uh, Archimedean. And this is the case uh, on which I'm going to focus more today is real and complex. So, and uh, uh, so, uh, and in this case, in the Archimedean case, uh, so we can define KK operators acting on this space. I will say more about this space in a minute. Uh, but uh, so, what it means and so on. But uh, this is um, basically, well, here we work with, uh, so one uh, difference uh, between these two settings uh, is that here we have to work with all bundles. Not uh, so, so even most degenerate ones, because they do contribute to the story. They have no, non zero measure. Here we have a, this stack, and then there is an open substack of stable bundles, which is a smooth uh, manifold. And then the other bundles are kind of set of measure zero. So when we do L2 theory, it is not, uh, we don't have to consider them. And this allows us to focus on. Uh, stable bundles only, which is both a blessing and a, a problem. Uh, it's a blessing because this, uh, this modular space of some such bundles is much simpler. And it's a problem because um, in this story, it's more natural to consider the stack. And if as, when you stop doing so, you run into, run into various issues. So, and, uh, so in this story, we'll, so, so, so we are going to have some KK operators. HX lambda on this, uh, uh, on this space. And, and uh, but, but now we have also another kind of operators. So uh, they will commute with another kind of operators. Uh, which which are quantum Hitchin operators. So this is in the Archimedean case for yields and complex numbers. And these are exactly the operators that were discussed by Roman in his talk. So he uh, talked about the theorem of Bellinson and Drinfeld that global differential operators on the bond, on bundles uh, is a commutative algebra, polynomial algebra, uh, which is amorphic to functions on orders. And uh, so, uh, so, so, so the harmonic analysis on the space uh, reduces to studying uh, common eigenfunctions of these Hecke operators and uh, th these functions will also be eigenfunctions of these differential operators. Okay, so let me uh, start explaining this in more detail. And maybe I should explain connection with geometric Langlands. It's the third flavor of Langlands theory that is around. In geometric Langlands, uh, so uh, functions, uh, which are eigenfunctions of Hecke operators, 
uh, I interpreted uh, uh, so well uh, they're complex valued, but it's really doesn't matter. You can consider eldic values, and in this case, they interpreted as traces of Frobenius in some uh, perverse sheaves on the stack, and uh, then uh, one uses uh, so one could also consider perverse sheaves uh, with complex coefficients. Uh, and in this case, it is the same thing as holonomic demodules with regular singularities. So geometric language says that instead of considering functions, uh, let us consider holonomic demodules with regular singularities. And then we can take any field of characteristic zero here. And so the relationship between analytic and geometric language is that instead of considering the demodules, uh, uh, we more or less consider solutions of these demodules. Okay, so let me get into the details. So, uh, so, uh, uh, so these, uh, in geometric language, the main object is so-called Heike eigen sheaves, which are uh, demodules uh, with regular singularities on this stack. And, uh, um, well, they correspond to arbitrary local systems on the curve with values in the Langlands dual group, G, 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 conjecturally. Uh, but um, there is a particularly nice sub, uh, collection of local systems, which are oppers, and that's exactly what Roman explained. And um, then um, the main result of this paper of Berenson and Drinfeld, as Roman explained, was that um, the D module corresponding to an oper is easy to describe. Namely, it is just a D module uh, determined by an eigenfunction of uh, of these differential operators, kitchen differential operators, and uh, we will it tur will turn out that uh, such eigenfunctions, but real analytic ones, arise here uh, when they are uh, single valued, and so that's uh, basically what what the connection is. But let me. Uh, get into the details. So, uh, so I'm going to uh, restrict to the case when G equals to PGL2 uh, and X uh, is a smooth projected curve over F over our local field. Uh, and I'm going to consider a uh, uh, bond G of x t1 up to tn, where these are uh, distinct points in x of f. Uh, so, uh, so this is a moduli space of bundles with parabolic structures. So this is what corresponds to uh, so-called tame ramification. So Jive talked about the, the simplest case of wild ramification, but it was just with two points on the P1. And I'm going to talk about tame ramification, but with any number of points. And right now on any curve X, but general, uh, very soon I will stick to P1 because this is the only case when we proved some theorems. Yes, I will. Uh... Okay, so let's... <laughs> Word. Okay, so uh, so to, so I want to define uh, Hecke. So so first of all, uh, uh, let me define the no. So I said that we can restrict ourselves to stable bundles. So first of all, let me explain what this means: bundle with parabolic structure. So E uh, is a, a principle. Uh, PGL2 bundle on X. And this is the same thing as a uh, rank two vector bundle. Uh, modulo uh, tensoring with line bundles.
and uh, so uh, so what is a parabolic structure? So we have these fibers uh, for, for every uh, i. We can look at uh, uh, the fiber of E, uh, and I view it as a rank two vector bundle, module tensor ring with line bundle, and uh, I look at uh, point Ti, uh, and so I can look at the projectivization of this. So this is isomorphic to P1, uh, and uh, a parabolic structure. or more precisely quasi-parabolic structure, but this is a technicality, is a choice of uh, Si in this projective line. Uh, so, uh, and uh, so a parabolic, uh, quasi-parabolic bundle is a, um, uh, Principal bundle with a choice of such parabolic structures at each point ti, and uh, now uh, there is a notion of stability. So, as you remember, notion of stability of a vector bundle is uh, defined by. Uh, so you, you you have to define the slope of the vector bundle, which is the degree uh, divided by rank. And uh, a stable bundle is one that doesn't have subbundles of slopes that is less than the slope of the bundle. And we will do the same thing here, but we need to take these parabolic structures into account. So, uh, so we define slope of E. Well, uh, so so, uh, so slope of E denoted by mu of E. It is uh, going to be well the degree. Uh, sorry, rank divided by degree, uh, uh, rank divided by degree, and so, uh, excuse me, degree divided by rank. So in the this case, uh, this is a bundle of uh, rank two. So, so this is one half of the degree uh, plus just a constant n over four. Where n is the number of points, so that's that's easy. But then, uh, if you have a line subbundle L and E, then mu of L is going to be degree of L as it should be plus n L over two. And so let me explain what this n L is. So we have our curve, and here are our points. Let's say t one, t two. And we have our parabolic structures with are certain lines here. So this is going to be S1, and this is going to be S2 inside the fiber. So we have the fibers, which is a two plane here. And uh, now, if we have a line subbundle, this means that in every fiber we have another line. Uh, and uh, some of these lines may coincide with the parabolic lines, and some of them may not. So if you have L, so L of T1 could be this line, but then L of T2 would be this line, which coincides with S2. And so in this case, uh, we have, we have uh, that this NL. So NL is the number is the number of i's such that LTI is equal to SI. So in this case, this NL equals to one. Okay, so this is uh, what the parabolic um, uh, slope is. And definition uh, E is stable if uh, mu of L is less than mu of E for any L inside E line subbundle and semi stable if mu of L is less than or equal to mu of E. For every L 
contained in E. So, uh, and the proposition, which is well known, is that a uh, uh, stable bundle uh, form a uh, uh, quasi projective variety. Which is smooth and uh, semi stable modular S equivalence, uh, certain equivalence relation. It, it's a projective variety. So this is a certain variety B uh, and uh, one S stable bundles and this is variety bond ss semi-stable and uh, uh, this is an open set in, in this one so stay for stable bundles the notion of equivalence is trivial uh, two di different uh, stable bundles are not as equivalent but for semi-stable it is not the projective variety may be singular However, what this shows is that if n is odd, then stable is the same as semi-stable. So one S is a project, smooth project is right. No, I did not define. I will. It, it is beside the point for this talk. Uh, so, uh, and uh, now uh, we want to consider the the space H. It's a Hilbert space, which is L two of this uh, bond S. So I'm not going to write G X anymore. I just write bond S. This is the space of stable bundle. Question? Yeah, sorry. Uh, you said semi-stable implies stable for n is odd, but th is this equivalence relation also vacuous then? So that yes, yes, it is vacuous. And it implies for a very simple reason that this number has denominator four in that case. And it can never be equal to this number, which has denominator two. Right, Th that makes sense. I'm just like, Yes, I think I'm good. Thanks. Right. Okay, now we want to consider this space. Now you may ask, what does this space mean? So, so this is a manifold. So what is L2 of a manifold? So we need to fix a measure. If we consider functions, but the trick, we don't want to fix a measure because there is no natural measure of this. And the trick is, uh, as usual, instead of considering functions, we have to consider half densities. So this is the space of complex uh, half densities uh, f such that integral over one s of f squared is finite measurable of course so so this integral is uh, canonically determined because uh, if uh, f is a half density then absolute value of f squared is a density, which can be canonically integrated over this manifold. So uh, now uh, I need to define Hecke operators. So this is a Hilbert space, therefore. And uh, now uh, I want to define Hecke operators. So to define Hecke operators, uh, I first need to define an uh, algebraic geometric thing, which is called Hecke correspondence. No, you say that there is no measure. No, 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 no. There is no, uh, no, there is no measure, but still the notion of measure zero makes perfect sense. I mean, there is no canonical. Uh, Top four. There is no canonical density. More or less. Well, first of all, that remark was informal. I didn't make it precise. But also, uh, you know, even though uh, 
uh, we don't have a canonical measure on one yes it is perfectly uh, for any manifold without any structure it makes sense to talk about sets of measure zero and this is a manifold over our local field so it's an analytic manifold for example for a non-median field it's an analytic manifold over this field uh, so what is Hecke correspondence? So this is, uh, uh, so Z is uh, uh, the set of triples E, E prime and S, where E and E prime in one S uh, and S stable. And S is going to be uh, an element in projectivization of the fiber. Uh, so let, let us fix a point X in our curve X, which is not equal to TI for any I. So a point that is away from these points. Well, later we will allow them to coincide, but right now away. Uh, and uh, this S is in the fiber here. And uh, we should have uh, uh, in a short exact sequence. So, uh, of sheets, which is this kind of sequence. So, this means uh, that sections of this E prime uh, are uh, sections of E, which are allowed to have first order pole. Uh, so uh, sections over open set U of E prime is sections over open set U of E rational. Uh, so, uh, so maybe let me call it gamma one, uh, which is uh, sections allowed to have first order four. At the point X with a residue in S. And again, uh, the notion of residue only makes sense for differentials, uh, doesn't make sense here, but it always makes sense up to scaling because also residue depends. We can trivialize, if we choose a local coordinate, we can trivialize um, to choose a trivialization, but. Uh, and in this case, the residue will be rescaled. If we go from one coordinate to another, the residue is rescaled, but it makes sense to say that it lies in this one dimensional line S. Okay, so this is ZX. Uh, this is the Heke correspondence. And the, why is it called correspondence? Uh, by the way, uh, I, uh, this is defined in uh, classical Langland story for arbitrary bundles. But I will only look at the stable part where both E and D prime are stable because that's what's relevant to our theory. Uh, there are also points where E is stable, but E prime is not, and where E prime is stable and E is not, and so on. And so this ZX maps, uh, first of all, to bun S <coughs> by the first projection. Also, it maps. To bun S to the, by the second projection, and then it maps by Q into the uh, into the curve X. Actually, uh, well, well, maybe uh, this is Z X, and but we can also consider Z, which is the set of E E prime S. X and S, so, so X making X a variable also. So, so this is a union of ZX. It's a, it's a vibration. It, it fibers over the curve with fiber ZX. And uh, so, uh, so this Z maps to these three things. And uh, well, one uh, problem that we get from considering stable bundles. So in the usual case, this map is, uh, is proper in the fiber is P1. But in our case, it is not because we only consider stable bundles. And, the, so, and the, this will create some trouble because we have to integrate over non-compact sets and this integral might diverge. 
So this is the price that we pay for considering only stable ones. Okay, so uh, it's a map which forgets, uh, maybe I should call it P3. It's it just uh, maps. Right, right, now we make X very. All right, and so then now the important theorem due to Bellinson and Greenfield. So, so let me explain something. So uh, now Hecke operators in classical Langlands, uh, for Hecke operator in the classical Langlands, this setting is already sufficient because all we do is uh, you, when you want to make a, a Hecke operator of a function of a bundle, you just take the sum over all Hecke modifications. So this E prime is called Hecke modification. of P at the point S using S. And so these Hecke modifications are parameterized by S. And um, then uh, when we define Hecke operator in the usual uh, language story, we just say we take the sum over all Hecke modifications, um, maybe uh, all Hecke modifications of this bundle. There are finitely many of them, namely Q plus one. And uh, so this makes perfect sense. But in this theory, he, the set of Hickey modifications is a, uh, some open subset of P1 over our local field, which is infinite. So we cannot take a sum, we have to integrate. And if you have to integrate, you can only integrate a density. You cannot integrate a function. So you have to show that the object you will get is of the correct kind, of, uh, that it is actually a density. So that's why you need this theorem. But luckily you have this theorem. So what is this theorem? It says the following, that there exists a canonical isomorphism, let me call it A, uh, from P1 upper star. Uh, so, 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 so it's a section, it's, there is a canonical non-vanishing section A global section of P1 upper star of canonical sheaf of bond S to the minus one tensor with P2 upper star canonical one to the plus one tensor omega squared. And I will explain what omega is in a second. Tensor Q inverse Q upper star of KX uh, to the minus one. And so what is omega? Uh, is the canonical sheaf of the fiber of uh, P2 uh, cro uh, uh, cross Q uh, from Z, well, maybe from just Z uh, X to of P2 from ZX to bond S, uh, P1, S, uh, no, P, P2, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, so the canonical shift of the uh, uh, fiber of P2. So you have, uh, so, so, if, you can draw the ZX like this, and then it maps to bond S by the first projection, and also to bond S by the second projection. And we have fibers here and here. And these fibers are P1 
few ones, maybe with some points deleted. So, uh, so omega is the canonical shift of, uh, so if you have some point uh, in Z, then omega is the canonical shift of this fiber. Potential, potential, potential. Uh, it's a one-dimensional thing, and uh, so this is the theorem. And now this, uh, 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 so uh, so now I can make a definition. So the Hecke operator. Uh, H to H is the operator the following operator H sub X psi of E is the integral over a E, e prime s in zx of psi of e prime times the absolute value of a to the one half, uh, and uh, so so uh, uh, so this is the uh, uh, so it's a one-dimensional integral because it integrates over all over the fiber uh, of, uh, uh, of P1. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I need to say just a second. So uh, E is a psi of E prime. So, so this is fiber of P1. So, so I think I need to write P1. Uh, so this is P two. This is P one. So A is uh, A is this section. Global section. Yeah, over Z X. Over Z. Yes, over Z. Over Z. Any comments uh, on the discussion? So you, you just show that, uh, I mean, the baby version of this is that you, you, to prove this uh, lemma, you need to go to the local picture to the fine grass mine. But actually, uh, one the e easier version of this lemma is that this bundle is trivial. But actually, not only is it trivial, but there is a choice. There is a canonical choice of a section. It's not only trivial, but it's canonically so. You can see it locally, yes. Anyway, so what does it mean? So we have a, a two form. Uh, we, we, we have a half density on, uh, on bun S here. Uh, now, uh, here we have, uh, if we take absolute value to the one half, we have half densities minus half densities. So they cancel each other. And this gets erased. And then uh, we want to get an answer, which is a half density on uh, of E prime, of E, and, uh, and this will be, uh, yeah, maybe. I confused this again. Like this. Okay, uh, so uh, so uh, so you get a half density here, and then you have uh, get a density with respect to this uh, to this fiber, and uh, uh, you get a minus half density of this. So this means that you can integrate it. So if you fix x, it is a density. And you get an answer which depends on x as a minus half density. So this is an operator, which is uh, uh, which is a half 
which is a minus one half density with respect to x. But now there is an analytic question also. Uh, does this integral converge? Because I, I did say that, uh, phi, uh, so this is an integral over P1, but actually not over the whole P1, but over P1 with some points deleted. If you compute what happens at those points, you do get singularities there. So you have to worry about convergence. So the questions, the analytic questions that uh, are uh, you raise is for which psi is it really well defined? And so this is the first question, analytic question. And second analytic question is uh, why does it land in age? Uh, so so we, don't, uh, we don't actually know how uh, the answer in general, but there is a conjecture. So, so there is, first of all, uh, I can answer the first question. Define some space of functions on which this integral is well defined. And uh, so, uh, for this purpose, we take open set. So, U is an open set. Uh, uh, so, so, let me uh, call it bun. Uh, very stable. So this is open set of bundles which do not admit one zero nil quadrant X field. Recall that Higgs field is a section of the adjoint bundle tensored with uh, one forms. This is uh, what uh, appeared uh, in, in the talk of Jigli. And uh, uh, so this is an open set, uh, which is very nice. So this is actually the set on which the Billinson Drinfield uh, D module, which is the eigenvalue problem for these differential operators is smooth. So this is uh, exactly the locus where it is all coherent. And so, uh, so let psi, so if psi uh, is a, a smooth function with compact support, Uh, in uh, this bond Vs, then uh, uh, the integral Hx psi of E converges to every E in one S. And so it defines the defines the smooth function. Uh, so, uh, but but if you have uh, if stable the set of stable bundles is not uh, compact, then for example you uh, you will have questions on uh, why this function lies in L two. Well, uh, and when I say functions, uh, I, this is really what I mean is half density, but I will just say function for simplicity. Okay. Uh, well, if it is compact, it will be in L2. Uh, or not? Mm, <clears throat> not, well, usually, yes. Zero 
Yeah, yeah. So, so in this case, uh, there will be no singularity. So, uh, so it will be it will be nice. So this means that the separator is densely defined. Because this space is dense in L two, uh, but uh, but never. But then we have to ask whether it extends. And now we'll conjecture this HX extends uh, to a compact uh, self adjoint operator of H. Uh, so, in particular, it has discrete spectrum by the uh, theorem, uh, spectral theorem for such a operator. Uh, and also, uh, uh, Hx, Hy equals zero. And the intersection of kernels of all Hx over x in x of f is zero. Uh, Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, so when we make this conjecture, is really, I mean, X of F could be empty. So in this case, you should uh, you will have K operators corresponding to uh, divisors defined over F. Uh, but uh, uh, so let me uh, assume that this is not empty. So I assume that X of F is not empty, which of course will be automatic if I have at least one parabolic point. And so this means that H uh, is a direct sum of some H lambda uh, over some discrete set lambda. So this is the spectrum, uh, which is a discrete countable set. Uh, and th this is an eigen, uh, eigenspace, finite dimensional eigenspace. Hmm? So if you have a compact self-adjoint operator, it, eigenspaces are finite dimensional except for the zero eigenspace, which could be infinite dimensional. But here there's zero eigenspace for all these operators is zero. So, so you have the spectral decomposition. And uh, so now I will switch to uh, genus zero because uh, this is the case when I can prove something. Uh, Depends on what? Uh, no, we will. Uh, we expect that this is true for all fields. For all fields, and uh, uh, but no. But then the question is: the whole point of Langland story is not to prove something like this, but to characterize the set sigma. And this set sigma, in the case of Archimedean fields, uh, as Roman mentioned, we expect that it will be. Uh, uh, parameterized by authors with real monodromy, which means they have monodromy in SL2R. But in the case of PADX, uh, this should be correspond to some analog of uh, Galois representations. And uh, we don't have a, an answer in this case. We only have some idea. Uh, yes, uh, I, this is true and X is in P, P1 and I will uh, now explain this. If X is not P1, then Q is the first. Because right. it's HX is uh, X is not P1, but then Q. No, 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 but it's not, uh, I, I mean. Yeah, yes, uh, so. Uh, uh, no, it is not holomorphic. Uh, 
it's 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 smooth in the case so in the archimedean case it just means smooth well smooth or real and it's actually real uh, it's so so over uh, real or complex numbers it is smooth and even real analytic but not complex analytic and over uh, archimedean field it is locally constant well uh, what by what which i mean that every matrix element is locally constant Uh, so, uh, so the theorem is that this conjecture holds for x equals to p one, uh, and uh, so uh, so the interesting case is when n is at least three because uh, otherwise there is no stable bundles for n equal three it's also not too interesting because there is just one uh, bundle and there is a one-dimensional space uh, but but actually n greater equal to four uh, so uh, so let me explain what happens in this case now so in this case uh, we have uh, uh, so the bundle E uh, is uh, so stable. So, is, so, so we can work by rationally because uh, uh, because we are going to integrate. So we can work uh, throw away any sets of measures. Z. And so generically, so E in bond S is generically. Uh, okay, so there are two components. There is a bond S equals to one S uh, zero union with one S one, which are bundles of even an odd degree. Because we have a modular tensor ring with line bundles, uh, we don't have a notion of degree, but we only have a notion of degree modular two. And so these are two connected components. And actually they are isomorphic because we can do uh, Heike modification so, so we have this SI is the Heike modification at the point TI using uh, S uh, uh, using S equals to the parabolic structure SI. Uh, and uh, so, so this is uh, from one S to itself. Uh, and so the, it is well-defined uh, map. And it's actually, and actually, it's involution. Si squared is one, and also they commute. So this is an action by regular action of the group Z mod two to the n on this uh, variety, and in particular, but it permutes each Si switches the two components of course, because when you do a Heike modification, degree increases by one. And so in particular, uh, S infinity, so, so let's say we have points uh, T0, T1, T, and minus one and infinity, which is Tn. And uh, so then the, we will use S infinity to identify bun S0 with bun S1. And then we can, uh, focus on just, uh, we can just consider H, let's say zero, which is L2 of one as zero. Uh, and th uh, then we can uh, uh, consider operators from it to itself, because when we do a Heike modification, we can combine it with this S infinity and go back to degree zero. Now, what do bundles look like? So E in bun as zero, is generically trivial, so it's O plus O. And so that means that parabolic structures uh, are just SI like in standard P1, because fibers are the same everywhere. And uh, so, uh, so we are going to take of course, we can act. There is an action of PGL2, so these SI are defined up to 
uh, fractional linear transformations because trivial bundle has a tomorphism PGL2. And so we are going to uh, take uh, the following uh, bundles. Second. Okay, so uh, so at the points uh, t zero, we will will take uh, so so let's say this t zero equals to zero, and we will take there uh, s zero will be pair one comma zero, and then t one up to t n. Here we will take one with y one up to one with y n, and uh, zero one, so infinity we will take point zero one, and uh, so this is s one, and this is s infinity. Okay, and so uh, so then uh, we see that uh, uh, so this bond uh, s uh, by rationally by rationally is identified with the set of all these one by one through y n modular simultaneous scaling. So uh, n, uh, n minus one, I'm sorry. So this is projective space. Uh, of dimension. Uh, yeah, so, so, uh, so you have n, ah, sorry, this is up to n minus two because I, I think I, uh, there should be n points. So this is up to n minus two and n minus one. So they are lab labeled from T zero to T n minus one. And so this is n minus three. So it's projective space P n minus three by rationally. And, uh, and so uh, uh, then the Heke modification, there is a nice formula for Heke modification. Heke modification. At the point uh, x s of the bundle corresponding to y, so so this call this bundle E y this corresponds to y, which is a vector y one to y, and so on, and so this is equal to E z, uh, where uh, z is given by the following formula z i is equal to x y i minus s t i divided by y i minus s. So that's uh, an easy exercise. And uh, so, uh, so this half densities can be identified with uh, the set of functions uh, f or psi of one to one y and minus one minus two uh, such that uh, psi of lambda y equals to lambda to the power minus m over two psi of y and minus. Uh, and so this is a, a, a satisfying the L2 condition. So the appropriate integ integrability. And then there is a formula uh, so, so, or another way to say it, it's the functions of psi y zero, y one up to y n minus two, such that psi of y zero plus a y n plus two minus two plus a y zero y n minus two, and uh, this. Uh, and uh, 
and then they kick the operator hx. There is a nice formula for it. So in this second realization, integral over f of psi of t0 minus x over s minus y0 uh, psi tn minus x over s minus yn or m is going to be n minus uh, times the norm of ds divided by product of s minus y i. Uh, from i equals what zero to m. Uh, so and uh, so this is an explicit formula for this KK operator, and from this it is uh, so probably I should stop here. Yeah. Huh? So uh, so uh, I feel this is a, my my local field, and so uh, where this norm is. Uh, Norm of A is absolute value of A, where A is an R, and absolute value of A is squared if A is in C. So, uh, and there is periodic norm when A is periodic field. And using this formula, it is not difficult to show that it is compact. So, it uses some representation theory of the group PGL2F. So, uh, so theorem. Also, it, we can find the uh, again. Uh, so there is a discrete spectrum. So spectrum of Hx is the set of offers with real monotony. And uh, unipotent. Uh, Uh, singularities at the points T0, Tn. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, more precisely, we proved that this set is contained in this one. Uh, and in the case of four and five points, we proved that this, this containment is in bijection. And uh, okay, so uh, th this is for the uh, field equal to complex numbers. But for real numbers, the story is a bit different, but we can also characterize uh, the spectrum. Uh, it is uh, all the orders that uh, are contained in the sort of, which are also so-called balanced connection. And so this variety of balanced connection is a certain sub variety of all connections, which is kind of similar to reality condition, but a bit different. Okay, so I think I should stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions either from here or from Zoom? I have um, two questions. So first, um, but this conjecture, uh, so especially the first part, this extension to a compact operator. Um, well, it's phrased in this functional analytical uh, terms, but is there some kind of algebraic or geometric uh, like reformulation of this related phenomenon? Yes. Uh, so this reduces to some uh, statement. So, so how did, is this compactness uh, proved? So. Uh, uh, so in general, so, so there is this uh, kind of basic theorem that if you have a, a kernel which is continuous, k of x y, which is continuous, then it defines a compact operator. Well, unfortunately, uh, yeah, what's going for? let's say we are in the case when we have uh, n n is odd, so then uh, our we have a projective variety. So we had a kernel. Uh, which is continuous, then uh, we would have a compact operator. However, it is not going to be like that because uh, this uh, kernel is supported on a set of uh, dimension n plus one, where n is the dimension of one instead of two n. 
So uh, at least we need to convolve, and at least we need to raise the separator to the power n to have a, a kernel which is which has full support. But it's not going to be continuous. It's going to have some singularities. So what we uh, well we have to show that okay, but it will still uh, if we if we uh, raise it to sufficiently large power, we are going to have a continuous kernel, or at least a kernel which with singularities which are not too bad. And this is a question about algebraic geometry. So it's really a question about some. Uh, okay, if you to write it down, it will be a question about log canonical thresholds or some things like that, or B functions. Roots of B. So the roots should not be too close. Yeah, and, and another question. So, uh, well, for SL2, I guess this uh, operas correspond to projective structures on the curve. And then for those with real but not the there is this grafting operation where you change the Riemann surface, but I think it sends a uh, projective structure real but not the to again projective structure real but not the And that, uh, that's right. Uh, yes. Does it corresp uh, correspond to something on the, the level of Eigen functions? So uh, I agree with your conjecture. So if you have an Eigen fun, uh, so you, if you have, uh, um, so so there is uh, one opera uh, which which is. Uh, Kind of distinguished, and this is the so-called uniformization order, which corresponds to uh, uh, really for uniformizing uh, this uh, p1 minus a few points with an upper half plane, uh, modulus some Fuchsian group, and uh, that order corresponds to see well. So if you write uh, down uh, this kernel, you, uh, it's it's like a positive matrix, so all elements are positive. So it, so we have. Frobenius Perron theorem for its functional analysis analog, uh, which is called Crane Rutman theorem, which says that there is an eigenfunction which is positive, a unique eigenfunction which is positive, um, and it has the largest positive eigenvalue. And uh, this eigenfunction corresponds to that order. Now, other orders with real monodromy, uh, well, they will have a solution which uh, single valued solution, a real analytic single valued solution, uh, because SL2R is the same as SU11. So you have Hermitian uh, invariant form, indefinite form on, on the fiber. And when we make Hermitian combination, it will be a single valued real function. And so that function will have zeros. And so the zeros uh, are going to uh, live on some curves, which are non-intersecting. And these curves uh, are, you know, they could be used as uh, these grafting contours. Apparently. So, uh, so that's basically roughly the connection. But we don't have, uh, we haven't worked out, out these details in full de uh, this in full detail. Uh, Sasha has a question. So you have uh, spectrum, but can you present us at least? one example of eigenfunction well so the problem is uh, that these uh, Hitchin systems are not matric so uh, Hitch, uh, th this is the simplest example of systems which are next level of complexity after matric systems so they, they cannot solutions cannot be written as uh, integral and therefore i cannot uh, really <laughs> compute the eigenfunction so in the simplest example for uh, so the simplest example is uh, four points on P1. And in this case, uh, what you get is Lamia functions. So Lamia well, functions- You have an example. Well, yeah, but it's not, I cannot write. Uh, so Lamia function is defined as solution of some differential equation. And there is not, uh, there is no really better definition somehow. Uh, it's not like hypergeometric function where you have many different definitions, power series, integral differential equation, and so on. No integral representation. So Lamé functions do not have integral representation for generic parameters. There is for special for, uh, for special uh, uh, configuration, such as for example, if all these points lie on the uh, on the equator and are equally spaced, uh, then uh, the largest eigenvalue can be an eigenfunction can be computed in terms of hypergeometric function. Because when you mod out by Z mod N symmetry, you get three points. Uh, you, you get North Pole, South Pole, and one point, which is the image of all those N points on the regular N mod. So 
when you have uh, something more like some like Lame functions, so some characterization, you said in the beginning, citing Roma, that uh, these are solutions of this uh, D models which depends on the input device. Right. These D models are not material, so that's the problem. So you cannot you cannot describe them as direct image of a one-dimensional local system. That uh, your eigenfunction, your function, your function, your function, your function, your function. Exactly, yes. So there will be a theorem that uh, these integral operators commute with uh, quantum Hitchin operators. And in particular, eigenfunctions are solutions of uh, the real analytic solutions of the Hitchin system and also complex conjugate Hitchin system. But uh, the Hitchin systems are not. Uh, they're not, they don't come from point theory. So you cannot. Uh... First of all, a very trivial question. The set of operas in the last statement, it's a trivial part because all of operas by definition is part of your spec of the set of operators, right? So that all of operas is some vector space. Uh, spectrum of all of operas, algebraic spectrum, which is just in the sense of algebraic geometry. It's just some some affine space and then uh, these uh, real operators like for example in the case of four points on p1 so th this is just a one dimensional line where i'll draw it as a complex plane for complex numbers and then uh, these real operators they form some discrete subset which is more or less uh, it, it's more or less a lattice but it's a lattice at infinity and in the finite part it's a distorted lattice but how to see that from uh, well, uh, it's a compact self adjoint operator, so it has a discrete spectrum. The operas with real monodromy are discrete. No, it is not easy to see. Uh, it is proved in the case of GL2 in the paper by Faltings. In the, uh, in the case of higher groups, it should also be true, but uh, it is not, I don't know how to prove this. It's, it's, a, it's a problem in uh, differential geometry, but, uh, uh, but I, asked, uh, I asked Donaldson, for example, and he, he did not know how to prove this. But how do you prove this? So what do you need to know? Uh, so- What is the idea? Uh, so so you, you prove that uh, uh, these operators commute, they commute with, uh, so there is something that is called, uh, so, so there is a certain differential equation, which is, uh, uh, it's, uh, so there are these, uh, so quantum Hitchin operators in this case are Gauden operators, GI. And then you prove something like this, that uh, HX times the sum of GI over X minus TI equals to uh, some uh, opera multiplied by X. So, so, some, you have some equation like this. Uh, and uh, and so, so from this equation, you can deduce that these operators commute with GI. And also if you have an eigenfunction, GI psi equals to mu I psi, then uh, the eigenvalue of a, uh, X, HX psi is going to be beta of X psi which will satisfy a differential equation like this. Uh, D uh, x squared uh, plus one over x minus x psi dx uh, times beta x is equal to some uh, mu i over x minus ti times beta x. It's a second order ODE. And there will be a similar equation with respect to X bar. And uh, so this is an opera. So in, in order to have a single valued solution, you need monodromy to be in SU11 so that uh, it, uh, you have a Hermitian combination. And so, uh, so this is how you can show that, uh, that it's, uh, you, you get operas with real monotony. And if you have an opera with real monotony, you can uh, define 
uh, some uh, you can show that uh, the, uh, there will be a single valued uh, solution of the Hitchin equation. The only question is, is it going to lie in L2? That's a question, what kind of singularities it's going to have when we take non-very stable bundles. So in some cases, we can show that these singularities are L2 singularities, and we always expect them to be so. But um, for six and more points, this modular space uh, has some more complicated singularities, and we were not able yet to prove that. And this is why I say that this is a subset and not the whole set, because I, I, I'm pretty sure it is the whole set, but we can only prove it for four or five points. So maybe in view of the time, we should uh, stop the discussion uh, here and uh, thank the speaker again. And we'll resume at uh, 4.10. чтобы было всем понятно. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's okay. I, I, I didn't mean this break, actually. I just... Uh, uh,